Since the class is called Data Analysis, it makes sense to start off by asking, what is data? And where else would we turn for that definition than Wikipedia? Data are values of qualitative or quantitative variables belonging to a set of items. Let's start from the end of this phrase and work to the beginning to unpack what we mean by data. So first of all, a set of items. In a statistics class, this is sometimes called the populations. This is the set of objects that you're interested in studying. In a clinical study, it might be a set of patients. Or it could be the set of visits to a website. Or it could be all the cars that come off of, out of a particular factory that you want to measure for durability. Variables are measurements or characteristics of that item. So for example, for patients, it might be response to a therapy. For cars, it might be their durability or how long they last. And for visits to a website, it might be how long people stay on the website or what they click on while they're there. The variables can be divided into qualitative or quantitative variables. Qualitative variables are variables that can be defined by a label and have discrete values. So for example, some qualitative variables in a clinical study would be country of origin, the sex of the patients, or the treatment that they've received. Meanwhile, quantitative variables are numerical variables that are observed on a particular sliding scale. So for example, height, weight, and blood pressure of patients are all quantitative variables because they are measured on a numerical scale. Now that we know a little bit about data, we need to talk about the two different kinds that you commonly observe in a data analysis. First is the raw data. This is the data that it comes from the original source or machine that was used to collect the data. It's often hard to use for data analysis either because it's too big or because it's in a format that's very hard to manipulate. Data analysis includes the processing of the raw data into process data, although these steps are often ignored when performing downstream data analyses. The raw data may only need to be processed once, but those steps should be recorded and included in the report of the data analysis. Process data, on the other hand, is data that is ready for analysis. Processing can include merging data sets together, taking subsets of data to make them smaller or to focus on a particular group of, of objects, by transforming the numbers by take, by, to make them um, on a more manageable or correct scale, or dealing with missing data or outliers. There may be standards for processing for particular types of data, and those the standards are often used over and over and over again. But all steps should be recorded because you might do something slightly different in the way that you process the data. A specific example can set, shed some light on the difference between raw and processed data. This is a picture of a high-seq DNA sequencing machine. This machine is used to sequence DNA in clinical studies. DNA is the sequence of about 3 billion base pairs, or letters, that is unique to each person. We will consider the data from this machine to compare raw versus processed data. Don't worry if you don't understand every step and how the machine works. The goal is just to illustrate the difference between raw and processed data and to show you how raw data can be relative. The machine works by breaking down the long 3 billion letter sequence up into much shorter sequences or fragments and attaching them to a slide. DNA has four different base pairs or letters, A, C, T, and G. Each base pair is then labeled with a different color dye and the slide is scanned and a picture is taken at every position along all of the fragments. These are what those pictures look like. The images are then processed by a computer and at every position on every fragment, each of the four letters A, C, G, and T gets an intensity value. A statistical model is then used to determine which letter appears at which position in each fragment. For example, for this fragment, at this position, the letter might be C because it has the highest intensity. The result is a very large set of short sequences of letters, maybe hundreds of millions, where each fragment is maybe 100 letters long. These estimated fragments are then pieced together like a puzzle to get the sequence of letters in a person's genome. Here, the raw data could be the image files right here, but they are huge often terabytes of data, and contain lots of information that we may not need. Similarly, it could be the intensity files, but those are also often very large and may contain information that aren't, isn't necessary for assembling genomes. 
Most people use the sequence fragments or the short sequences of letters as the raw data for as assembling a genome. This is a very compressed version of the data and it makes sense that it's possible that these compressed versions of the data depend heavily on what algorithm you used for scanning the images or the statistical model that you used for calculating the letters based on the intensity file. The important thing to note here is that it's critical to keep track of all those raw data processing steps and also to keep in mind that changing those steps might lead to different data analysis outcomes. So what do raw data look like? These are an example of those short fragments that might come off of a DNA sequencing machine. It's a short sequence of letters of A's, C's, T's, and G's, and above it, some information about the quality of those letters. This information is very hard to process and analyze directly as it is, and is often processed a step further before humans actually interact with it. Another example of raw data comes from an application programming interface, or an API. This is an example from the Twitter API, which you can access through websites. These websites then give you data in a particular format that can be used for analysis. But the format of the data is structured in such a way that it might not be easy to perform analysis directly on the raw data itself, like this data here, which is in JSON format. Another example of raw data is electronic medical records. Electronic medical records might take, contain information collected by doctors on treatments, on patient history, or on other characteristics of the patient, and might include things like free text, where a doctor is actually just written in a description of what they observed. It's again very difficult to analyze these data directly without some level of processing. So what do process data look like? They look something like this. This is an example from a paper that we published in 2011 on peer review. Each variable appears in one column, and each row corresponds to one observation. So for example, this rook column only contains the variable on which time the, the review was completed. Meanwhile, this row contains all the information about that particular review. Another thing to keep in mind is that process data contains tables or data files that store one kind of observation per table. The reason why is because you don't want to be able to, you don't want to have to separate out whether you're talking about a particular person or maybe a hospital or some other larger unit of measurement like a state all in one particular data table. So there would be a data table for just the patients, a data table for hospitals, and a data table for larger units of measurements like states. I've linked to a paper here about tidy data that gives more information about how process data should look when this processing steps are complete. So how much data is out there? This is an infographic that suggests that there's 1.8 zettabytes of data that were created in 2011. You might dispute this exact number, but it gives you an idea of the order of magnitude of how much data is out there. What is 1.8 zettabytes? It's equivalent to three, three tweets per minute for every person in the United States, all 300 million, tweeting every minute for about a year. That's a lot of information, but not all of that information is useful, just like not all tweets are useful. So what about big data? Big data is all the rage right now. This, for example, is a picture that I took when I was in the San Francisco airport that talks about how the cloud is meeting big data and how that's an important development for companies and scientists in the world. Big data is usually refer referring to any data set that's too big to manipulate, handle, process, or analyze with a single computer. But this depends a little bit on your perspective. This is a picture of an IBM 350 hard drive. This hard drive can store about 5 megabytes of data. During this class, you will definitely be analyzing data sets larger than 5 megabytes, and so they would be considered big data by the standards of the people that use the IBM 350. So why are we talking about big data now, if it's always been a matter of perspective? Here's an example. This is a study that was performed in 1969 where 296 random individuals in Nebraska and Boston were asked to take a letter and mail it to a friend who would mail it to a friend who would mail it to a friend with the eventual goal of ending up at one target individual in Boston, Massachusetts. 
they collected 64 such mail chains and they calculated that the average number of people in between the original person that the letter started with and the target person was 5.2. This number got rounded up and became the usual term six degrees of separation that you may have heard about before. So why are we talking about big data now? Well, this is a study that was done in 2008 where they studied instant messaging data. They studied 30 billion conversations on 240 million people and came up with a new number for 6.6 .6 degrees of separation between individuals, which they rounded up to 7 degrees of separation. Big data is such a hot topic because it's now so easy to collect so much data for so little money. And it's not clear that our computers have kept up with the pace of data collection. But regardless of the size of the data, you need the right data. So this is a quote by John Tukey, one of the most famous data analysts. He said that the data may not contain the answer. The combination of some data and an aching desire for an answer does not ensure that a reasonable answer can be extracted from a given body of data. So that means focusing on the question that you're interested in is better than focusing on the size of the data. Because I would add to this quote, no matter how big the data are, even if the data are gigantic, if they aren't the right data, you won't be able to get the answer to your question.